Part of what's interesting about aquifers is that they don't necessarily follow topography. So just because you're on top of a mountain, the other thing I'll do for tomorrow is I'll get a board so I can draw some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, on, if you're on top of a mountain, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to drill a well that's 2,000 feet deep to hit the water. And the reason that is is because the aquifer is actually following a vein of rock that goes up the mountain. So the aquifer doesn't necessarily stay down close to where your streams are. But here's the other interesting thing that might be not something that everybody knows, which is that let's say you haven't had rain in three to five days and you see water flowing in the stream. Where's that water coming from? At that point, it's not coming from any runoff, right? Because we're three to five days past a rain event. So all that water that you're seeing, whenever you see streams flowing after rain, that's all coming straight out of the aquifer. Which is different than straight out of Compton. It's straight out of the aquifer. Um, and it's, it's just as rad as straight out of Compton. But we want straight out of the aquifer. And the thing about straight out of the aquifer is that there are things that we can do as human beings with how it is that we reforest the land and revegetate the land to make it so that what we see in our streams, what we see in our springs, is a better maintained average flow rate, meaning low, low flow and high, high flow, as we call them in hydrology, which is a flood event is high, high flow, a drought event is low, low flow. So during droughts, your streams will maintain a better equilibrium, and during floods, your streams won't flood as bad if you have more trees in the surrounding landscape upon which the rain falls. The less vegetation and the less trees you have, the worse floods you're going to have and the worse droughts you're going to have. So the best way you can address surface flows, the best ways you can address aquifer recharge, and the best way you can moderate things like flooding events and drought events is to revegetate and reforest vast areas of the land which have been severely denuded, deforested, and are suffering from ecological fragmentation. So most of what we're looking at today when you walk the eastern seaboard and you're doing current culture site assessment, you realize I'm looking at a landscape that's been consecutively deforested three to four times. The entire eastern seaboard has been cut down, all the trees, three to four times. First, cut down all the old growth forests, all the way to the northwest. Then, cut down all the forests again. Then, cut them down again. Then, cut them down again. And so what you're seeing now is a hammered, paltry semblance of what used to be here 500 years ago. And is barely managing to eke out an existence of some modicum of health. Managing to because of the fact that it's one of the most ancient geologic mountain ranges in the world. Because the Appalachian Range is estimated to be approximately 350 to 500 million years old. So it's the oldest mountain range in the world. And what that means is that it has very, very deep soils, which means it's very forgiving to human folly. You go into the tropics and you do that. You go onto the west coast where the Rockies are more like 40 to 60 million years old. They're a young geologic phenomenon. That's why they're bigger. These used to be huge mountains, but over 500 million years, the mountains reach the sea. They reach the sea a whole lot faster when humans keep cutting down all the trees that are on them. Because then you get massive erosion gullies and you lose all this topsoil and you lose all this phosphorus. We can certainly build topsoil faster than some of the estimates that are given on how long it takes you to build an inch of soil. But suffice it to say, and I'm sure most of us can intuit, that it takes a long time to build soil. We probably don't want it to just be washing out into the ocean. But when you have an agricultural production system that looks at soil as a sterile medium that's pretty much used to just be infused with water-soluble nutrients and hold up the plants, it could be pumice. Who cares? It doesn't have to be alive, right? That's what chemag. That's how chemag approaches plants and approaches soil. So that's the vast amount of land use that's happening, is this extractive, exploitive, reductionist land use that doesn't care at all about this living stratum of soil.